beautiful Sunday afternoon. It's uh, almost 12 o'clock, um, top of the hour, and um, we're doing episode 61 today of Gar Boris's Time Machine. We're going all the way back to 1976, Gar, in your time machine, and we're going to be talking all about Charlie's Angels. Now, Charlie's Angels was an American crime uh, uh, drama, as you know, Gar, on ABC from September 22nd, 1976 to June 24th, 1981, the show. Aired on ABC, as I said, for five seasons and a total of 115 episodes. Now, when I suggested uh, doing an episode on um, Charlie's Angel, even um, even today you messaged me, oh man, I'm so looking forward to this. So uh, let's tell the story, Garbors, how you first um, got into Charlie's Angels and what the show means to you. Well, just like every other male. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I you know, when uh, when you're, like, watching uh, TV and you see commercials about a brand new show that's coming that's got three Hot amazingly yeah. beautiful women, yeah. um, you know, you're, you're going to check it out. Yeah, definitely. You know, it, 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 you know, basically, you know, there is a very simple rule in advertising. And it, the rule is sex sells. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can't not argue with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that is so. That is true. So true, you know. And of course, um, the original cast um, uh, consisted of Kate Jackson, Jacqueline Smith, and Farrah Fawcett, who then went by the name uh, Farrah Fawcett Majors, of course, because um, her husband at the time was uh, Lee Majors, a six million dollar man, and he'd also gone to be the um, fall guy but um let's get into it i mean um i i mean it was it was quite a, a hot looking cast if i if i dare say so i and the thing was um interestingly enough um uh, behind the scenes from what i understand they were all really um good friends and on a show like that uh, which is kind of a first of kind um where you got like three kind of hot women on the same show you, you'd think there'd be all this backstabbing and and kind of competing against it uh, um, one another. It didn't seem to be that it was that type of um, stuff going on behind the scenes. Well, you know, it's it's always a fifty fifty about those kind of things. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? You yeah. can never really know. <laughs> uh, you know, you can never predict. Yeah. You know, when when you throw people together, you know how it's going to work because sometimes it works like magic, and then sometimes it uh, explodes. But that's but that's also the same premise for uh, MTV reality shows sure. uh, when reality shows uh, first started because they used to. Do uh, have have a show called Real World. I remember that. Yeah, they take a bunch of people that don't know each other and they're completely different personality types, and they throw them in a house and see what happens with a camera crew, yeah. and let's see what happens. And yeah. it always winds up exploding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know because of the personality types. Yeah. You know. Um, so you know. So you, you know. It, it, you can't predict. Yeah. But, uh, you know, um, you know, there is a prediction that you can do if you're doing a reality show. If you do this and yeah. you throw a bunch of people together, you're probably going to get some really electric scenes. Oh, sure, sure. And of course, as we mentioned, Gar, Charlie's Angels was a weekly uh, crime drama um, um, that was um, like no other crime drama before. While there had been many other crime dramas on television before Charlie's Angels, um, they were very different. I mean, type of shows, Gar, for the simple fact that um, this was a, this was a show that was centered around um, like um, women. Where the previous crime shows are basically like detective shows. They based around men mainly because even back as um, far as the 1970s. Um, being a cop and a detective was still thought of as a as a male dominated thing, you know. And so, this being an all um, female cast, that's kind of what really made a show like this um, stand out. Uh, absolutely, you know. I mean, uh, you know, it, you know, during uh, that time period uh, when the uh, you know show launched. Uh, it was a male-dominated world. Um, you know, women uh, were. Uh, you know, in 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 the uh, in, in the nineteen seventies, women couldn't even have a credit card. Yeah, yeah. Under their name, they had to either have it under their father's name, or they had to have it under uh, their husband's name. And uh, because at that time, 
you know, it was viewed that women, women were viewed like children, that they would not be responsible enough to be able to handle uh, having a credit card. And that is the truth. Yeah, yeah, we've talked so about you, that. You know, I mean, anybody can do research yeah. and look back at this. And, uh, you know, I was alive during that yeah. time and I was aware of it. Yeah, and you know, you know, but you know that that's just the way women were viewed at that time. So when you have a show like this, um, you know, it, you know, uh, every, uh, you know, everybody was uh, looking at it as as they were taking a chance. But the people that were spearheading it knew that it was going to be a huge success, you know, because you know of the fact that sex sells, and yeah. that's exactly the formula that they were using. And I dare say that um, this show, Charlie's Angels, was kind of a um, test pilot for um, to, to see if um, sex really did sell. That, that if a show like this would really work. I, I mean, I dare say it was kind of a, um, like I said, te test pilot. And and again. Um, Go back in TV history, and when you think of, like, crime fighting, probably, I know, immediately to my mind comes Batman and Robin. That's nothing like what this was. But And again, even um, this was considered a crime uh, drama, but not so much like a police show where it's based around, you know, a detective going out and trying to solve a crime. This was a show based around three sexy, good-looking um, private detectives that, that were get involved in crime fighting. And... Um, and, and we're going to get a little more into it because, um, you know, another th another interesting ask. Well, I, I got to say, Gar, you know, when I announced we were doing today's show, I, I put the announcement up on our Facebook today. And I, I put the famous silhouette that um, started each and every episode. And I want to talk a little bit about that because I've seen that picture many times over the years without even the Charlie's Angels logo. And the minute you see that um, silhouette of the three girls, you know what it is. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, you know nowadays it's it's a classic uh, female pose that women do uh, when they're having fun. You know, uh, yeah. you know you can look on uh, a lot of Facebook, and then you have three girls that are you know you yeah. know really tight friends. Yeah, yeah. And then you see a picture that they're doing for fun, and it's them posing as Charlie's Angels. Yeah, you know, another interesting aspect of the show, um, we got to mention is um, actor John Forsyth, who provided the voice of the show's title character, Charlie Townsend. Um, this was a, a unique role gar in that it was only John Forsyth's voice that came over a loudspeaker whenever he would speak to the Angels. In the entire run of the show, John Forsyth never appeared on screen. We only heard his voice. And, you know, when, when you go back in TV history again, we, we think of, like, hearing, you know, somebody like Wolfman Jack or famous um, t even TV game show announcers and, and where you get to know these people on the vo um, their, uh, just for their voice or even going back, talking about, like, somebody like Casey Kasem that was on the radio. You get to know, um, you get to know these people's voices. We never seen John... In fact, John Forsyth, most people never really seen him on... Um, on the TV screen until he started appearing years later in, in the uh, nighttime soap opera Dallas. But um, this is where John Forsythe first became known. And like I said, it's a unique role in that, you know, he was one of the stars of the show, yet we only heard his voice. Um, we never seen him. Well, uh, you know, being fr from being around during that time, yeah. uh, I was well aware of who John Forsythe was way before, before. Charlie's okay. Angels. Uh, because he had a hugely successful movie career oh. uh, previous to that. Wow. wow. And he was, he was a very well-known actor, uh, you know, before he was ever on Charlie's, uh, Angel. Charlie's Angels. Wow. And so, uh, you know, you know, me being from that generation, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, basically everybody that was watching the show at that time yeah. uh, knew who he was yeah. and recognized his voice. Wow. And, uh, and, 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 you know, what it, what it always did, it, you know, because I knew myself, I, this was going through my head too, was, uh, are they going to show him? Yeah, yeah. we all know who he is. Yeah. He's a extremely famous actor why are they not showing him yeah. but 
But but in reality, you know, the the decision for it to only be his voice really kind of added a mysteriousness to the show that really worked. But I have to be clear about that. He was he had a hugely success. I mean, anybody can look at him wow. up wow. in Wikipedia, yeah. and he was hugely successful way before. He I got to tell you, Gar. Um, I got to I got to thank you, Gar, because. Um, there's quite a, uh, a bit of difference in our age, and that might have something to do with my lack of knowledge of that. But um, thanks for bringing that to um, our attention because it is really um, worth mentioning, I think. But uh, maybe it's because of my age, I had no idea of that. You know, like a lot of things I thought. Um, yeah, okay. he's from the wow. black and white movie era. Oh, maybe we got to do an episode on him to kind of further educate people. But, but, but yeah, you know, um, and so, so for many of us, um, even just from Charlie's Angels on, a lot of people, when they think of uh, John Forsythe, I guess, unfortunately, they just think of him from Charlie's Angels in Dallas. But it's interesting to learn from you that he had much more of a career than that. I, I think maybe. Oh, yeah, yeah. From my generation, yeah. we know him from, like, not just Charlie's Angels. Yeah, yeah. We know him from all his work wow. that he did previous to that. And he has a huge catalog body of work wow, wow. previous to. Uh, Charlie's Angels. That's interesting. To, that's very interesting to learn. And you know, um, Gar, um, I, I kind of compare it to Cheers. You know, if, if you're all a uh, Cheers fan, um, the character of Norm Peterson is this, um, it's played by George Wynn, and he's kind of this big fat character. Like, he's got a beer belly because he loves to drink beer, and that's kind of a joke throughout Cheers. And, and you always hear him talking about, you know, his loving wife, Vera. We, ne we never see her in the, um, in the whole um, run of... Uh, Cheers, but um, we, we come to know and love Vera, and it becomes a joke. You know, this guy's always out, you know, leaving his wife at home alone, but we never get to see Vera. It's very much like, um, I, I think what they did with uh, John Forsythe on Charlie's Angels is kind of along those lines. That it worked that um, I think it would have ruined the show, maybe now in retrospect, if they would have ever revealed what Charlie looked like, you know? Yeah, just like John Forsythe, you know, it really... Uh, you know, it, there are unique cases where yeah. that is the better decision. Yeah. And when they did that with Norm, it was the better decision. Yeah, yeah. And when they did that with John Forsyth, only having his voice, uh, it, it, it turned out to be uh, the right decision. And, and what's really funny is, is when you watch those old episodes and you look at the box that his voice is coming out of. Yeah, yeah. It, it looks like <laughs> uh, a lot of versions of Bluetooth speakers that we see today. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and Gar, like, um, we, we talked about before and we talked about earlier in today's episode, Charlie's Angels remained a very popular show for the, um, uh, for the entire run, but, but the, show, um, the show had its um, critic... Um, Oh, excuse me. Okay, but the show was very popular. Like, first couple, it stayed in the top 10, I think, for the first two seasons because that's uh, the first two seasons con uh, consisted of the original cast. But um, what it was saying is um, this was a very different type of show, like we said, because it centered around three good looking women. They were the, um, like, three leading roles in, in the show. And it said it centered around their looks. And this became known as Jiggle TV. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and, and it, 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 Critics were reacting that way, uh, but it didn't matter how the you know, the critics had no impact whatsoever on the show, whether it was successful or not. Yeah, yeah. The public gravitated to that shore like a magnet because those women were absolutely beautiful. But you know, there was also. Uh, a lot of writers got fired yeah. uh, from that show because at that time, writer writing was dominated by men. They yeah, didn't yeah. have <laughs> yeah. women writers, and if they would have had, uh, you know, women writers writing for the show, it would have totally changed. 
uh, you know, the storylines and the interactions between the, the women, um, you know, that was lacking because women, men just don't understand, you know, how women interact and, and all that stuff. And because there was, you know, the, you know, the writers were men and uh, the, uh, the stars were women, there was always this dissatisfaction between the stars and the writers because the writers were just kept coming up with, um, you know, kind of chauvinistic yeah, storylines. Yeah. Makes, makes you sense. know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, you know, so there, you know, they, it, the writers for that show was literally a revolving door, you know, because of that problem. Yeah, yeah, and um, I was reading that um, it was not until the fifth and final season of Ashogar that um, the show fell out of the top um, 30, and that had a lot to do um, with the f fact that the show's original cast members leaving, and um, at the end of Charlie's Angels, only um, Jacqueline Smith remained from the original cast. Yeah, well, you know, she... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> she outlasted the, all of them, but you know, it, it, I I look at it the same way that people look at Guns and Roses. Sure, sure. It's the five original, original members yeah. that uh, when the the band actually did their first album, yeah. and that's that's what everybody holds dear is the five original members. Yeah. And and it's the same thing with Charlie's Angels, and it's not a disrespect to yeah. the any of the uh, following actresses, but the, the the public looks at it and 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 embraces the original cast the most. Yeah, and, and you know why that is? I mean, like a lot of things, like you're talking about, like especially with something like Charlie's Angels, um, it's the case because that's that's um, if the original cast was our our uh, the first taste we got of Charlie's Angels. That's our Charlie's Angels, if you know what I mean. And they they did everything to keep the show running as long as. They can, and it makes sense, but it's almost kind of like um, when Suzanne Summers left um, Three's Company, and they had three actresses that came after her. And 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 you noticed um, with every cast change on Three's Company, oh, we got to get a we got to get a blonde, we got to get a blonde. Um, they, they wanted to fo follow the formula, so to speak, and like so very much like same thing, like Charlie's Angel and Fair Fawcett left. We we got to get another blonde. Um, and and so again, it just people had a different taste. Of, or vision of what their Charlie's Angels means, and then you bring in these other characters. It's just not the same. And again, nothing against their acting, like you said. It's just, it's just a different version. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, you know, uh, I think <laughs> you know the the replacements were incredibly you know beautiful too. Sure, sure. You know, so you know, I mean, and and you know, I, I think Cheryl Ladd was the first. You know, because she replaced Farrah Fawcett sure, sure. after the first season. Yeah. Um, she was uh, the replacement of all the bunch that had the most success. Sure. Uh, out, out of uh, being on, uh, you know, uh, you know, from that alumni. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, of all the people that were replacements, she wound up having uh, the most uh, success. You know, but you know. Uh, you know, it, it, they all enjoyed success after being. Oh, on, sure. Including Cheryl Hack, which was the uh, actress. I mean, she's. I mean, she is stunningly beautiful, but she enjoyed the least amount of success uh, from that show. Yeah. Um, you I, know, but uh, she, even even she enjoyed having success uh, after. Uh, being on that show. I mean, it, it's kind of like being a, um, you know, if you, like a, a former, um, a former member, let's say, of the Dallas Cowboys. You may not be part of the original, um, you know, the original bunch, but um, but it, it's um, an ever-growing kind of um, fraternity, and to be part of that team, it, it, it means something. So, to, to all the girls that were on the show, the original cast and the, the replacement members, um, they were to 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 be uh, thought of always as one of the Charlie's Angels. I think that's the uh, Something you can, um, you know, take to your grave. It's a, some, a, a proud badge of honor to wear, you know? Yeah, yeah. Now, now also, uh, you know, I found out, you know, while doing the research that uh, Gig Young was the original Charlie. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. And, 
you know, he wound up getting fired uh, just before uh, this whole thing was, uh, you know, uh, getting started, uh, you know, because, it, you know, it was discovered that he had a serious drinking problem. Mm -hmm. And when you think about it, all he had to do, he didn't even have to ask. Act. All he had to do was just basically read the words off of a piece of paper into a microphone, and he couldn't even do that. that I mean, that is a serious drinking problem. Oh, sure, sure. And, you know... And, and, yeah. But Gig Young is another actor uh, from the John Forsyth era wow. uh, that also had a hugely successful career uh, from the black and white uh, movie time period. Uh, Gig Young was hugely successful and had a huge body of work oh, wow. uh, before he was uh, considered for it. But, but by the time he was doing the uh, Charlie's Angels gig, uh, his alcoholism was just too advanced. Oh, wow, wow. And, and you know, um, Gar, and talk about Charlie's Angels and, um, you know, the show's place in pop culture history. Um, like anything, when you have success with something, years later, when they can think of nothing uh, better to do, they want to, oh, um, let's, let's, let's have a new Charlie's Angels. Let's put that on TV. Well, they did a reboot in um, 2011. However, I was reading it only lasted for like... Um, seven episodes because again the show was the original show was so beloved that um anybody that was around back when the original show was on uh you we just have trouble seeing anybody else in the role of our angels but kate jackson fair fawcett and, and jacqueline smith and again by the time they do a reboot um they, because it's modern day they they don't they don't want to make charlie's angels like it was in the 1970s they oh uh, we're gonna we're gonna make it modern day we're gonna um um, we're not going to copy a copycat to the original show, and, and the, that's another reason that doesn't um, really work. Because if you're if you're going to reboot something that I loved growing up, don't don't try to change it too much, you know. Well, you know, it, you know, it's reboot uh, yeah. successful, you know, it, you know, and and it's because you know um, whenever you do a reboot. Uh, they're basically setting themselves up for that same quandary to happen virtually every time yeah. because you have the fans from the original time period that long, you know, for that. And then you have the fans, the new fans, you know, that are, you know, have their interests peaked. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it, 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 it's like, it's preordained. Yeah, yeah. You know I mean, whenever you do that with anything, you're going to have the older fans from that time period clashing with the newer fans from the time period that the reboot is is occurring. It, it, you know, it, it's just it will it it, it it it's as reliable to happen as as the sun is to come up every day. Yeah, and now Charlie's Angels Gar, I was reading, was uh, created by these two guys. Um, I, Ivan Ivan Gaff and Ben Roberts, they came up with the idea of Charlie's Angels after seeing um, the success of Police Woman on TV, which was TV's very first crime show that starred a woman. So again, like we were talking at the top of today's show, there have been um, previous crime dramas and police detective shows, but um, it was actually a show like um, Police Woman that predated Charlie's Angels where they thought, oh, well, that would be interesting. Could you imagine if we did something kind of similar, but instead of having one, one good-looking um, woman on the show, we're going to have three good-looking women, it's, and, and instead of being police, we'll make it like they're private detectives. So that is kind of where the idea for um, Charlie's Angels really kind of came from, police women. Now, you were around back then. Do you remember police women? Were you at all a fan of that? I, I was around, and I was aware, you know, of... You know, police woman. It wasn't really my cup of tea. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, yeah. Know, this type of shows, um, but uh, because I was, you know, from uh, you know from the older generation, I'm also aware of the first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, female lead in a cop show, and uh, it, that was from the '60s, and it was a black and white TV okay. show called Honey West. Wow! Wow! And at that time, uh, that show was hugely successful because it was starring uh, a, a, a 
stunningly, I mean, absolutely stunningly beautiful woman named Anne Francis. Okay. And uh, and she was she had so many female fans from that time period that uh, that just I mean it, it, she was a magnet for those fans. Um, you know she actually influenced women doing something uh, that you know women weren't doing before that. Anne Francis had a um, I guess a, a, like a black mole okay. on either the left side or the right side uh, between her chin and her mouth. Okay. And um, you know, previous to that, people would look at that as a flaw. Yeah. But Anne Francis was so stunningly beautiful that when she had that, that women liked it so much that they would take black makeup and and put it on their face to to make themselves look like Anne Francis. Oh, sure, sure. She influenced, uh, like, I mean. Probably hundreds of thousands of women to do that because you know I remember seeing women you know with yeah. the dot again. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, it was a thing back in the sixties, and Anne Francis was so popular at that time that she influenced that in women. Wow! And she was the first. Wow! And then, uh, and, and 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 then you have. It may be about 10 or 15 years later, yeah. then you have police woman. But police woman Wait. probably wouldn't have been considered had it not been for the success of Honey West. Wow, Gar. I mean, Anne Francis was a huge, huge star at that time because of the success of that TV show, Honey West. Wow, Gar, you know, every time we do an episode, you educate me because your time machine goes a little farther back in time and mine. That's why I love doing these episodes. We always learn something new. We educate our we educate our listeners. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm cutting you off. But Anne Francis did guest two guest appearances on Charlie's Angels. Wow, wow! Once again, educating my friend. Now, now, Gar, back in 1974, when Police Woman um, first premiered on TV, it was considered a breakthrough to have a TV show that was led by a female star. In the leading role. Um, oh, sure, TV had seen both the likes of Lucille Ball and Mary Tyler Moore before Police Woman ever hit the TV airways in 1974. But, you know, um, you know, the, those were kind of comedy, um, family-friendly shows. Charlie's Angels, Police Woman, we start talking about stuff like that. It's the first time you've ever seen a woman on TV, like, in an action role, like, kicking ass. And, you know, you never would have seen Lucille Ball or Mary, Mary Tyler Moore... Um, you know, uh, fighting crime like that. <laughs> oh, one more thing about Anne Francis. Yeah. Okay. A lot of people that might not be familiar with Anne Francis, uh -huh. but did watch Twilight Zone. Uh -huh. Okay. This is an iconic Twilight Zone episode. Okay. That Anne Francis was in. And uh, uh, this iconic one was the one where she had a thimble and she wanted to return it because there was something wrong with it. Yeah, yeah. And they sent her to the 13th floor. Yeah. The 13th floor did not exist in the building. And uh, and everybody that she was talking to on the thirteenth floor yeah. turned out to be in in reality she was a mannequin. Wow! Wow! And she 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 didn't know she was a mannequin, and she was and all of these people that she was talking to on the thirteenth floor were also mannequins. Oh wow! Wow! And if, if that is an iconic Twilight Zone episode, that is starring Anne Francis, and that is before she even did Honey West. Oh wow! And, and Gar, you know, um, now we need to also bring up producer Aaron Spelling, 
who would go on to have a very successful career in television with many other hit TV shows, um, which I'm sure you've heard of, such as um, The Love Boat, Family, um, Heart to Heart, Dynasty, and, of course, 90210. So, I mean, um, Charlie's Angels might have been his launching pad, but because of his success with Charlie's Angels, he was able to go on and produce all those other hit TV shows. Yeah, and, and have he, I've seen pictures of his mansion. And, yeah. Um, uh, his mansion looks, I mean, it's gigantic. It looks as big as the White House. Yeah, and then I, in regards to Kate Jackson getting cast in uh, Charlie's Angels, um, apparently Aaron Spelling discovered her because uh, she had appeared in a... Um, Although it was in a starring role, I guess she appeared in a small role in um, the previous cop drama, The Rookies, and that's where he first seen her. And he initially offered her the, the part of Kelly Garrett, which would ultimately go to Jacqueline Smith, but actually Kate Jackson was more attracted to the character of Sabrina because um, she wanted to be she, she wanted to be thought of more for her, I'm talking about Kate Jackson now, for her brain than her looks. So she, she thought the uh, that role was more appealing to her so Aaron Spelling agreed to give her the role she was requesting well you know and you know she just she just was the of, of the three she was the most likely to play that part yeah yeah you know what I mean it, 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 you know when, when you just see them and you hear them talking and everything like that she yeah. just fits that part better than the other two uh you know but you know that that's just one of those things again you know it's it, you know we don't look at it that way yeah yeah we're men yeah yeah but women look at it and they see that as a chauvinist thing yeah. because you know only one of them can have a brain and the other two have to be ditzes yeah yeah, yeah. again again you uh, see what I mean? Billy knows. That is the battle that they were having with the writers. It was, you know, it, because the writers were male and they were female, and it, 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 it was a clash. Yeah, well, in all fairness, Gar, I, I got to say, um, you know, that is kind of the struggle, as you say. And maybe in regards to Kate Jackson wanting a particular role, maybe it's a case of her kind of knowing what she um, is better suited for, maybe just what she likes better, what she thinks like she can do a better uh, job of playing. But let's let's be honest here. As, as the old saying goes, uh, I think men are from uh, uh, men are from Venus and and women are from Mars. Meaning they, they they think completely different. But let's let's be honest. While men men get accused all too often of thinking only with their little brain, if you know what I mean, uh, I, I can't tell you how many times like I've heard a woman say they were going to vote for a certain politician just because he was so great looking, you know? <laughs> or, or uh, you know, it, it used to be a classic thing because I think men, mentally women used to, you know, just resign themselves, you know, to, to this. But the same thing with uh, baseball. You know, I remember way back in the 1970s, you know, I would, you know, talk to women. I, I remember asking uh -huh. uh, who their favorite Dodger was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it was always the cutest guy. Yeah. Or, you know what yeah. I mean? Uh, which whichever one was the cutest guy was their favorite, which you know of course would do the eye roll with guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but this is a two way street. Sure, sure. You know what I mean? Because because uh, men are just as guilty of equal things. Oh, sure. On the other side of the coin too. You know, with everything, there's always two sides to every coin. Oh, sure. And and we should also know, Gar Farrah Fawcett would be the next angel who Aaron Spelling um, w would cast in the role of Jill Monroe. Unlike Kate Jackson, who auditioned for her role, Spelling reached out to Farrah Fawcett about joining the cast of Charlie's Angels after he saw her in the 1976 film uh, Logan's Run. I remember Logan's Run. At, at that time, that was considered such an advanced movie wow. with such a advanced uh, storyline. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I think that, you know, it was, you know, pretty successful in the mid-70s. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that they tried to do a reboot, but just like always, when you try to do a reboot, it's you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You know, you get the clash of the old fans versus the clash of the new fans. Yeah. 
And, and say what you will, Gar, but isn't it interesting that um, while Kate Jackson had to audition for her role, Farrah Fawcett didn't. And I, I think it's kind of um, a, a, one of those fun, fun uh, trivia facts because um, when you look at the fact that maybe he thought, okay, we know she looks the part, you know, for, she fits the part of a Charlie's Angels, but, you know, maybe the first question is, can she act? And he saw her in the movie and thought, you know, there's no question that she can um, play this role. So very... Um, very interesting that she didn't even have to audition. He, he had that much faith in, in the fact that he thought she could do it. Well, you know, uh, there are people that are, uh, you know, famous, you know, because they wind up making the right decision. And in the inner entertainment uh, business, uh, having the ability to make the right decision more often than not can uh, equate in huge amounts of success. Yeah, and you know, also we should like we mentioned at the top of today's episode. At the time, she was uh, part of a big um, super Hollywood couple. You know, being the fact that she was also the wife of. Um, Lee Majors, a, um, a six million dollar man, and so if you remember back then, Gar, you're always seeing them on these entertainment shows, going out together, people taking photos of them. They're in all the paparazzi rags at the time. They were a, a, a big deal. So also maybe Aaron Spelling had, hey, well, boy, we could have a six million dollar man's wife in here. Well, yeah, and she's a talented actor in her own right too. You know, it, uh, it, she. Um you know, I, I think uh, the success of Charlie's Angels uh, wound up having a detrimental effect on her marriage. Yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, and uh, I think, uh, you know, she, you know, because I, I think he was probably putting pressure on her uh, that, yeah. was, you know, that was uh, not good towards her career so i think she wound up making the decision that it was better to uh, get divorced yeah. and have more control over her career well, yeah. and, and it turned you know because you know if if you have a husband try, you know trying to kind of keep you down yeah yeah you know what I mean? Uh, I, I think the rest, you know, uh, is a statement that she made the right decision when you look at, you know, how it turned out for her. Yeah, you know, another fun thing to look at, Gar, often when we do these episodes is how people are cast into the roles. And um, each of the original Charlie's Angels we've been talking about today, they each have a different, um, a different consideration, different way that they were uh, chosen for their ultimate role on Charlie's Angels. And let's get into Jacqueline Smith now. Um, while the producers of the show are very much like Jacqueline Smith, she almost did not get the role of Kelly Garrett. Get this, because simply because of her hair color. Producers originally thought Kelly Garrett should be a blonde uh, slash red-headed brunette. But it was Jacqueline Smith's uh, on-screen um, on, on -screen test that actually... Um, landed her a role they finally convinced oh you know look, look at look at her screen test look what she look how good she looks on tv yet yeah, she she can do the part but they almost didn't give her the part because of her hair color excuse me you could always dye your hair you could wear a wig but but almost somebody almost doesn't get a role because of their hair color can you believe that well you know it, 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 i can definitely see the people that are behind yeah. spearheading the show having this vision because the, the actresses haven't been decided and and, and it's it, it only exists in their brains yeah, yeah. and it makes sense you know if you're uh, a developer of TV shows that you would want to do you know a blonde a redhead and a brunette you know I mean it makes sense but you know uh, the truth of the matter is is I think uh, their their decision to uh, go with the kids chemistry between the actresses rather than the hair color yeah. you know uh, turned out to be the right decision and, and it, it goes back to what I was saying just a few minutes ago P people that wind up making the right decision more often than not yeah. uh, turn out wind up having mu you know much much more success and, and the ability to make those right decisions those people don't grow on trees yeah, no, that is yeah. a special ability you know that you know uh oh, very few people have yeah now gar here uh, here's probably the most interesting thing i picked up in doing my research for today's show um abc's top concern about charlie's angels was get this they did not think 
that TV viewers uh, would accept the ability of the three women to fight crime successfully on their own. That is the very reason why actor David Doyle was added to the cast in the role of John Bozzi. Um, they didn't think that that the people would be convinced that the Charlie's Angels could fight crime on their own. They needed a man to help them. That's See, was... <laughs> that goes back to what I was just saying before. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, 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 just, it, it just reflects the time period because that is the thinking of men during that time period. And men overshadow what men thought and what men, uh, you know, uh, mattered more at that time than what women. But when you can't argue with the ratings. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, um, in the spring of 1977, the first of many high-profile cast changes took place when Farrah Fawcett Majors announced she was leaving Charlie's Angels after the end of season one. Um, initially, the show um, did not want to let her out of her contract. They, In fact, so much. Um, this actually um, predates Suzanne Summers. um you know, leaving uh, or being fired ultimately from a Three's Company. I bring that up because um, very much this was kind of the first uh, court case where ABC took um, Fair Fawcett. They're going to try to force her to either pay up a money owed on the contract because all the Angels had initially um, signed a five-year contract. She was leaving before, way before the uh, five years came to an end, and so. They wanted her to either be forced to stay on the show or forced to pay ABC a ton of money. Now, ultimately, they, they made her all kinds of offers, um, unlike what they did with Suzanne. So they, uh, uh, tried to get her to stay. She ultimately, like you said, had a lot going on in her personal life, just wanted to leave, wanted out of the show. So ultimately, they agreed to let her out of contract. They dropped the suit against her. And all she had to agree to do was to, sh to show up um, as a guest in like five, or I think six guest appearances in the role of Jill Monroe, which is a, um, the angels that she played. Say, so so that, that was the agreement, and, and she was able to leave. Well, you know, the, you know the, the, the big, big difference between the two is that uh, Farrah Fawcett wasn't asking for more money. Yeah, that's the big... That's uh, the big... John Ritter wasn't getting paid $300,000 to her... What, like fifty grand yeah, yeah, per yeah. episode? Yeah. That's what was going on with Suzanne Summers. John Ritter, bless his heart, he was gr you know great, and this is not a rip on him, but he was being paid like obscenely more than the female characters on the show. But yet, the popularity of the show had a lot to do with the sex selling. Uh, just like Charlie's Angels. Yeah. I, you know what yeah. I mean? So, so the difference is, is, is Farrah Fawcett wasn't looking for more money. She just wanted out of the show to pursue other uh, things and, 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 and she was having marital problems. And, and the, the other thing about that is, is what I found out in, in my research is, is that um, she only had a verbal contract with Aaron Spelling. Oh, wow. It, it, it did not have a written, signed contract. Yeah, she, it, it, that just shows you the times again. Again. You they, know, at that yeah. time, it, this would not happen now. Anybody that gets, uh, it gets hired to do any kind of a TV show, there's a contract. There are there's litigation. You have your lawyers look it over. You have all of this this whole thing that goes on. Uh, verbal contracts virtually do not exist anymore. It is so hard to but prove. At that yeah. time, she had the leverage at that time because they only had a verbal contract with her. Yeah, you're so right, Gar. I mean, um, ca cases like um, between ABC and Fair Fawcett, it's a learning thing. You know, at the time when. Um, when these shows are kind of um, launching, they do not know as much as they do know about um, how things work in Hollywood. We, we learn as we go, as you, as you say. And um, I think actors and people on TV shows today have a much better than some of these people that came before them because we learn from what happened with these previous stars, you know? Well, you know, you, you look at it, and she she had the leverage in that situation. Yeah. But she was gracious enough to settle 
and do six more episodes to satisfy them. So it, it actually, in in her way that she was, ha- she handled it in a very gracious way. Yeah, yeah, and I think I do agree with you that the case with Suzanne Summers is different in the fact that she was kind of demanding more money, and people have their their different opinions on that. But what I will say is, while success of a show like Three's Company ran also like on Charlie's Angels with kind of a sex appeal thing going. Um, I dare say that if John Travolta had ever, I mean, if if, a, if a John Ritter, had, excuse me, ever left the show and they got a new new funny comedian, it was not going to be the same without John Ritter. He was a star of that show. It, you know, it might have been funny, but it would not have been as funny. And, it, you know, you know what I'm saying? So you have to also know your leverage, like you say, and your star, your, your star appeal. Well, you know, and, and the, you know, when when you look at these different, you know, situations, it's it's like the old thing, you know, uh, you know, if you don't look at history, then you're doomed to repeat. Yeah. You know, some of the, uh, you know, the bad things that wind up happening. So, yeah. you know, uh, it's it's always good to look to back. Know your history. And of course, Gar, as you can imagine, after uh, ABC announced Sarah Fawcett had left Charlie's Angels. The search for her replacement uh, was on. It was actually Cheryl Ladd, a former singer turned actress, um, who was chosen as, as Fawcett's replacement. Um, when Ladd was first approached about the role, she turned it down. ABC though then um, kept persisting that she try out, and she ultimately um, again she said, "Okay, I'll I'll I'll, um, I'll try it out." And she she gave uh, did a screen test, and everybody was so impressed with her that. Um, Ultimately, they convinced her to take the role, and and she was actually hired. The character um, she played was um, Chris Monroe, who was actually uh, supposed to be Jill Monroe, uh, which was played by Farrah Fawcett's younger sister. Uh huh. Yeah, and so so they they got they got a storyline already going there, and she she supposedly was coming fresh out of I think it said the San Francisco Police Academy, so. Uh, that's how um, they, they explained um, this new person coming into the be the new angel. Well, you know, uh, her first uh, her first day yeah. on the set, she wore a T-shirt uh, to kind of break the ice and and you know and you know just kind of start everything you know on a you know on a lighter note. Yeah. And on her T-shirt, it, it said. Spara Fawcett Minor. Wow. <laughs> at least she had a, a sense of humor about it. You know, um, um, like many shows at that time, Gar, um, what I found out in doing my research online was um, the show also became heavily um, merchandised, meaning the popularity of Charlie's Angels. Um, they, they started to sell stuff like T-shirts. I've seen they, they were Charlie Angels like lunchboxes. They started appearing on... TV Guide and all these magazines. So, uh, just on the success of the show, they were able to start selling stuff like that. Well, they also, uh, you know, Aaron Spelling tried to uh, launch a male-based spinoff uh, called Tony's Boys. Wow, you can see why uh, that didn't work, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> it went over like a yeah. lead balloon. Yeah, you yeah. Know, it just didn't work at all, you know. Because you know, it, 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 women sell sex better than men. <laughs> That's just the bottom line. You know what I think? I think would have worked better is um, instead of Tony's boys, because um, that that maybe leads people to think of, of something else. But I think it would even been better of um, having a female like lead. You know, like instead of Charlie's Angels, maybe. Um, Katie's Katie's Angels or something or um, I, I don't know I think it just would have worked better. Well, you know who knows? Yeah. You know it's it it just it didn't work. You know? Yeah. <laughs> but, but you know there there were so many stars that did guest appearances. Yeah. Uh, before they were ever famous, you know that you know they did. They did guest appearances on the show. Remember, I was telling you, Anne Francis did, you know, uh, guest guest appearances. But um, there was uh, a lot of people don't know about this, but I kind of 
personally feel that um, there was a show uh, from the 1960s that was a hugely popular show. Okay. Uh, it, it, and the, the show was heavily influenced. It was a cop show. Okay. And it was heavily influenced by the popularity of hippies at the time. And it was a show called Mod Squad. Mod Squad, yeah, yes, yes. Wow. And I, I, I look at that show as really, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, it had to have some kind of influence on someone, you know, it, you know, because it didn't have three female leads, but it did have three hippies. Yeah, yeah. Basically three cops that were undercover cops that dressed up like they were hippies. Yeah. And one of the actresses that went on to have uh, huge amounts of success was Peggy Lipton. Wow, wow. Peggy Lipton uh, wind up, wound up having a hugely successful daughter uh, that is a very successful daughter now. And I, I don't, I, man, for, for the life of me, I, her name escapes me, but she was, uh, uh, oh, God. Oh, wow. Uh, she was uh, the, wife, the wife of the guy in... Uh, uh, I love you, man. Oh wow! You know, that movie, I love you, man. Yeah, yeah. And uh, wow. you have, uh, you know, the the uh, uh, there's this one guy, and he he's got his wife. That's that girl that plays his wife is Peggy Lipton's daughter, and she is very successful today. Wow! Very well known and in 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 TV roles and commercials. I even see her in commercials, and that's you know, um, you know. Uh, that's Peggy Lipton from the Mod Squad, you know. So, but I really look at that. You know, that is one of those predecessors that's very close in its presentation uh, to what they were doing uh, with Charlie's Angels. Yeah, you know. Um, also, like I said, in, in doing the research, Charlie's Angels is described as um, like the, uh, the girls being like three pre private um, detectives, and and it's interesting because when when um, I think before that, most people, when, when you have an image of um, a PI or private detective, a lot of people think of, like, Dick Tracy, and this was very different than that. <laughs> oh, very, very. This really shattered that image, you know? Of there's, what? But there's so many famous people there, you know, uh, what's it, Casey Kasem. Wow, yeah, yeah. Did a guest appearance yeah. on, on, that, uh, on that show. Uh, let me see. Uh, Sonny Bono. Wow. A guest appearances. I can see it. Uh, let me see. Uh, Gary Collins, the game show host. Yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, did three wow. appearances you know, on yeah. there. Sammy Davis Jr. did guest appearances. Tommy Lee Jones did a guest appearance. Wow, wow. Vic Morrow did a guest appearance. Craig T. Nelson, remember the coach. show Coach? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Craig wow. T. Nelson did a guest appearance on there. Barbara Stanwyck did a guest appearance. I mean, I could just keep going on and and on and on with all of these famous people that did guest appearances on Charlie's Angels. And you know why they did that, Gar? Like, like even today when you see guest stars appearing on a, a TV show you, you watch, it's because, um, especially back in the days in the 1970s and 80s, you, you'd, um, you'd buy your um, latest edition of TV Guide and you'd see, oh, Craig T. Nelson's going to uh, appear on Charlie's Angels today. Oh my God! I'm gonna watch it, or especially somebody like um, maybe a little more high, high profile, like uh, Sammy Davis Jr. Oh, Sammy's gonna be on Charlie's Angels. I'm gonna watch that. I'm gonna. It was just a great way to get people, especially people that might not normally check out the show, who didn't check out Charlie's Angels every single week. Oh, but they might check it out if um, they're a Sammy Davis fan, and he's gonna appear on tonight's episode. You know, that's the way they got people to tune in. Well, you know, but then there's uh, there's some of these people that they, you know, they did these guest appearances before they were ever famous. Uh, you know, Jamie Lee Curtis. Yeah, she, yeah. You know, she was on, on that show. You know, so there's a 
bunch of these people that say Craig T. Nelson, when he did his guest, that was way hey, before, before the success of yeah. Coach. Yeah. So, you know, so a lot of these people that I'm rattling off, they actually did these guest appearances. Tom Selleck was a guest appearance wow. on, uh, on there. And this is all before they were ever famous. Yeah, you know, Gar, you know how many times that um, I watch, like, classic TV shows, like, um, I've seen episodes, for example, of um, the Mary Tyler Moore show where Henry Winkler like made a guest appearance before he was ever with Fonz. Anybody even knew he what who he was? And you know, oftentimes that's how actors get their start. They they get these bit roles, and then it leads to other things. You know, where they ultimately have a show of their own. Yeah, yeah, and man, it's it's so. Um you know, for me, because, you know, I, I, what I, you know, do for entertainment is it's a mixture of new and old. When I'm watching old stuff, yeah. you know, I, every once in a while I come across these guest appearances on different things before anybody ever knew who they were. And it's just kind of surprising whenever you see that, when you're watching yeah, yeah. an old episode and you're actually watching this person appear on this show you know uh, and, and just knowing oh my god that that person did that long before anybody ever knew who they were yeah you know it, it got a true a true sign that, that we're all getting older is um, the other day I gave you a perfect example a life is a great way to kind of uh, look look back in your life and things that you live through I mean me and this lady um, we we're talking at work the other day. This lady I work with, and uh, we lot, we work with a lot of people that are that are a lot younger than us, like in their twenties and thirties. And like um, we were joking about, like, hey, I I'm so old that I remember when minimum wage was four twenty five. I'm so old, I, I I remember I remember who the Fonz was, and like a lot of the young kids are like, what are you talking about? Who, who's the Fonz? You know what it is? It's like just, you want to know what minimum wage was when I was uh, you know when I got my first job? I can imagine. What. It was like a an hour. Oh, well, that, that shows you how times have changed, my friend. Uh, yeah. And, 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 and during that time, during that time, at, at a buck eighty-five an hour, uh -huh. not only did I was I able to save enough to buy a car, I was able to have uh, expendable income. I was able to move out of my parents' house yeah, yeah, and yeah. pay rent. Wow. And very, live on my own. Very different world. So what you're looking at is the, uh, you know, the, when you compare when I was in the workforce yeah. making minimum wage to what people that Make, are making yeah. minimum wage now, you can't do anything close to what I used to be able to do when I was young making minimum wage. Yeah, very, very, very different state of affairs, but you know, um, but yeah, it's, it's fun to go back, and like, I, I could, I could sit here all day and do this with you, but like, hey, Gar, um, we're, we're probably both old enough to remember, like, um, do you remember when they used to have a store, Jimco, Woolworths, um... Oh, I used to have a Jimco my, right down the street from my parents', and I used to shop at Jimco all the time. And I, the thing I loved about Jimco is, is it was my experience of the first of this, the, you go into a store, and it, it has everything. It, you know, it has grocery section, it has a music section, it yeah, yeah, yeah. Section. I mean, virtually anything you need for whatever it is that you need. And with it, you used to go to Jimco, and and you just all you needed to do is go to one store. Yeah, yeah. And to go to Jimco, it was also the first of the membership stores yes, that yes. I personally knew of. Yeah. I don't know if anything like that existed before me, but at my time, it was my first experience with a membership type of a show, a store like like what we like uh, what we know today as Costco. Yeah, yeah. You know, but 
Jimco was my first experience with a membership store. And you felt and, special, uh, didn't you? You went into Jimco, <laughs> and, and it was a one-stop. It had all yeah. kinds of departments. Sears was similar to it, but uh, Sears didn't have where you could buy groceries. No. Jimco, you could buy groceries, and you could buy anything else. You know, you know what Sears was for? I remember my grandmother telling me this, that um, it, it was known like mostly for appliances. It was known for a lot of other things, but... She would tell me, I'm always, whenever I need appliance, I, I get it at Sears. That's like, um, like uh, people from older generations, that, that's what they would think of stuff like that. And, you know, you bring up about Jimco being a membership place. It made you feel like, hey, I'm part of an exclusive club. But um, getting back to, I, I love uh, going back in time, but, but uh, getting back to Charlie's Angels to wrap it up for today, we, we have to also bring up the fact that by season three, Kate Jackson was ready to leave the show. And it had a lot to do with the fact that she was offered... The, um, the role of a female lead in the 1979 movie Kramer vs. Kramer, of course, uh, starring Dustin Hoffman. That role, as you know, ultimately went, Streep. Yeah, went to Meryl Streep, who won the Academy Award. So you could imagine her thinking, man, if I had only gotten that role. But um, the producers were, uh, unlike willing to work, they were to work with Farrah Fawcett, they, they were just, at that point, told her, no, you've got a five-year contract, you can't you can't shoot any movies. You can't do anything outside of Charlie's Angels. And they were just kind of at, at him. And so she couldn't take the role. She, she continued to do Charlie's Angels. But after that, too, she became dissatisfied with um, the scripts. And she complained all the time. She became such a problem that, that ultimately uh, she was fired by Aaron Spelling and ABC because they got tired of her complaining. Well, you know, if she wanted out, they should have let her. And they wouldn't let her out. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, yeah, and you know, um, it's kind of funny because you were talking about this other um, girl that originally was chosen to replace Kate Jackson. She was, and, and I guess Aaron Spelling chose her partly because she was a model at the time. I, I, um, you had mentioned this girl, I forget what her name was, but she, she um, was known as Char, uh, a Charlie model. Um, and so Aaron Spelling just loved the fact that they were getting a Charlie model for Charlie's Angels. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, you know, that, I don't know if they did, uh -huh. but I honestly, if if they didn't, they really should have. Yeah. They should have released Charlie's Angels dolls. Yeah, I, I, I was thinking about that. I don't know why they didn't. Probably you know, at the time they just... The Barbie? Yeah, because I, I even remember at this time they had Kiss dolls and stuff, and, you know, Barbie and G.I. Joe, that was kind of the rave at the time. So I don't know why they never uh, thought, but I did see they had... Charlie's Angels lunchbox and T-shirts, so that's kind of um, interesting. I, I don't think that stuff kind of really broke out in a huge way. Um, although they, they did it for Batman and other shows, so I, I don't know why they really didn't do that. That would have been a great idea. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, you, but it, I don't think that they did because we don't we don't hear about anything about it. memorabilia yeah. from that time time period related to that show being highly collectible. And if they did, if they yeah. did, and it did exist today, that stuff would be highly collectible. Yeah, and as, well, yeah. Collectible. Oh, sure. You would have heard something about her, seen it online when doing the research for today's show. Now, in looking for Kate Jackson's um, replacement in 1979, these are some people that were considered, I think you might uh, be interested by. Michelle Pfeiffer, who was not a big star back then. She was just kind of on the rise. Connie Selica and Diane Parkinson from The Price is Right. See, I'm from that time period. I know who Connie Selica was. Yeah, yeah. She was very pretty. In fact, I think um, I think she was married to the guy on Entertainment Tonight, um, uh, John Tesh. Ah, I did not know that. If I'm not mistaken, but uh, and I and I and she wasn't a TV show, but yeah, she, she she never broke out in a huge way. But she she enough people knew about who Connie Selica was. You could see why they considered her. Yeah, yeah, I remember. And, and you know, um, ultimately, the the they got um, the person they got to replace um, Kate Jackson was um, Tanya Roberts. But again, um, by the time um, Jacqueline Smith was the only original cast member on, it, the show started to dip in, in the ratings, and eventually, they you know the, the show was pulled off there. But but you could see even as Jacqueline Smith is the only original cast member, that's another one of those things for Jacqueline Smith that okay, well, I'm the only original. Um, 
Angel left from the original cast, so I'm now going to be in the starring role. I'm going to be in the leading role. I'm going to be the leading actress on the show because I'm the only original that's left. So she probably got a bump in her pay for that simple reason because when they had the three original cast members, they probably had to split a high percentage of whatever the salary was. Well, she she had negotiation power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so uh, you know, so you know, kudos to her. You know, being uh, being smart. Yeah. Uh, you know about maneuvering her career. And you know, before wrapping up today, Gar, we got you, you were talking about the fact that they they remain very successful um, in their careers after Charlie's Angels, and, and that's so true. Jacqueline Smith, I remember for years, um, outside of acting, she. Um, she also had her own fashion line where um, people can laugh and scoff if they want, but um, when Kmart was still around, her, her fashion line was being sold in Kmart stores, and, and she made a lot of money doing that. And I know she also um, continued to um, be a spokesmodel where she would um, – you'd also see her go on these um, like cable networks where she would sell jewelry and stuff, and she continued to make like um, – TV movies. I I seen her a lot, uh, a lot of those lifetime uh, lifetime TV movies. Kate Jackson continued to um, act, and eventually, years later, after Charlie's Angels, she also had a show with Bruce Boxleiter called um, Scarecrow and Mrs. King. I know that because my mother was a big fan of that. Kate Jackson looked very different from from what she did in Charlie's Angels, but you know, it was a different type of show. Um, once again, kind of, she was a private detective, but um, she uh, that was the last thing she was known to do. And, you know, these these ladies are still alive, except for Farrah Fawcett, sadly, of course, who died a couple years back from um, cancer. But they, they all continued to make movies um, for as long as they could. Well, t- 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 Tanya Roberts died recently, too. Oh, I wasn't aware of that. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, and, and, you know, it, it, t- Tanya Roberts, you know, because she was on the show, she was the last yeah. of the, uh, you know, Angels, and she was uh, part of that last season where the show wound up not having the ratings and wound up getting canceled, uh, you know, uh you know, you would you would think that you know uh, she wouldn't go on to have a you know have a uh, successful career after Charlie's Angels, but she did. Uh, she wound up uh, you know a very prominent part uh, on that '70s show. Yeah, yeah, you know, and um, I got to ask you, Gar. Other thing before closing for today, um, you know, besides the reboot on TV in 2011, they they also have had a couple successful movie versions of Charlie's Angels, like with Lucy Liu and and Cameron uh, Diaz and Drew Barrymore. Were you a fan of any of those movies? I, honestly, I, I didn't even watch it. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it was a reboot, and I just have this mental yeah. thing in my mind. You know, it, you could actually call it a mental block because I guarantee you there will be somewhere down the road that I'm not going to do watch something and then later on down the road I'm going to find out that I was wrong. Yeah, you know yeah. I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just have this mental block with reboots because I just have, you know, it, it, you know the, the successes versus the non-success, yeah. it's a huge dramatic difference. I will say this. I saw, I saw, I, I think there were two movie versions of that with, with those actresses and, and I liked it for what it was, but I agree with you. It, it was nothing like the original Charlie's Angels. And as funny, as great as actresses Cameron Diaz and Lucy Liu and Drew Barrymore all are, it was kind of more of a comedic spoof on Charlie's Angels, which is part of why as successful as the show might have, movies might have been, I didn't really like it because if you're gonna if you're gonna make a remake, try to make it as much like the original. I mean, it was. I, I think the most it was like the original Charlie's Angels was you know, like the hair color of the actresses, you know, okay, that's about the most it had in common. And again, um, I think you need a little more than that because I, I think what separates Charlie's Angels, the original uh, Charlie's Angels that we've been talking about from, from all the rest is that um, not only were these beautiful women, um, you know, in the parts, but th- that they kicked ass, you know. So, and, and it also showed that you could be a beautiful woman, kick ass, and have a brain. Well, yeah, you know, I, at least... Uh what's her name uh kate jackson yeah (laughs) at least she was able to show that you know it's just the way that the writers were 
uh, you know, portraying the other actresses, they, they you know, they they were not portraying them as intelligent like they were portraying Kate Jackson. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, it's uh, I just keep going back to that, but you know, uh, you know, it was it was a definite problem for that show at that time. But, but Igor, could you could you imagine if if you played one of the villains to say in a Charlie's uh, Angels episode, you could see how a, a man could be let's say, distracted by a good-looking private detective, kind of lose his train of thought. So, again, that, that was a fun aspect of a show. Um, it, it made it different than your, your typical cop show, you know? It sure did. Yeah, it yeah. really did. Yeah, or, I mean, it even kind of reminded me, going back to the original um, Batman from the 1960s with Adam West, how, um, you know, uh, you, you'd uh, see him get distracted, like, even when he, he'd be on the uh, screen with Catwoman. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. I, and I, I, I look at Batman the same way. Yeah. You know, it's that, you know, there's all this other Batman stuff that's followed. Yeah. The warmest spot in my heart is the 1960s Batman TV show. Yeah, yeah, I, know, I totally that agree. is the warmest spot in my heart for everything to do with Batman. And it's just the same thing with Charlie's Angel. Is It's that of the original three. And then yeah. the same thing with Guns N' Roses. It's yeah. the original five. Yeah, like, you like, know, yeah. it's just, it, you know, it, it just seems that, you know, I don't think I'm alone in this. No, no. You know, in, in having those warm spots in my heart, you know, for the originals. I think, uh, I think that's why the reboot failed, Gar. It only lasted seven episodes because... I can speak for you and me that that was our Batman. That was our Charlie's Angels because that was what we were first exposed to. And um, I've just had so much fun doing today's episode, Gar. And before we, um, before we go, um, I just wanted to share with people. Sadly, um, I learned before doing today's episode that um, Firehouse singer CJ Snare passed away. Um, it, um, some reports have been that he was suffering from colon cancer. So we just want to say we we're sorry to learn that news. And... Um, like many people, I was a Firehouse fan. I'm not a huge, uh, wasn't a huge diehard, but I can tell you, I, I really love that song. You know, um, "Love of a Lifetime" and "Don't Treat Me Bad." Probably "Don't Treat Me Bad" a little more because that was my first taste of Firehouse. So we just want to say we're so sorry to hear that. But um, next time, which we are really looking forward to, we're going to start a three-part episode on the Ed Sullivan Show. Isn't that going to be so much fun, Gar? You know, I mean, I don't know if Icon is substantial enough no? to describe him. We're going to get into that um, because it takes it's going to take three parts to do it. And we'll get into that next uh, two weeks from now. But Garth, thanks for doing this. I enjoy talking to you every time. Have a great rest of your Sunday. Oh, my God. I love doing this with you, brother. Brother, I love it too. Bye-bye.